Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you had a great lunch. Uh, we have three sessions uh, here. Uh, Alalina Sharma, uh, Director of Engineering, Internationalization and Research and Development, will kick off. Her speech will be about uh, the next building users on Wikipedia with open source language tools. So enjoy. All right. So after lunch, as Amir was saying just now, it's always tough to get a good crowd. But this is pretty good. I think, uh, thank you for being here. <laughs> and uh, I hope you had a good lunch and a good conversation. Please don't fall asleep, because there's lots of good stuff coming up. And uh, we are going to be talking about uh, all the cool things we're doing with open source language tools. And that's pretty important from an open web perspective, because Wikipedia is actually has uh, really, really, in the last year, focused in on extending multi-language support for uh, Wikipedia websites, uh, Wikimedia websites, and uh, we'll be actually supporting a lot more than just Wikimedia in terms of the web itself. So let me get started. Um, Sivan introduced me, so let's let's move on to actually the uh, uh, just of the prior the presentation itself. Wanted to give you a little bit on the definitions because sometimes it is actually confusing to understand the distinction between internationalization versus localization and multilingualization, which are all three areas which are very interconnected with each other. But if you look at Wikipedia itself for the definitions, which the link is at the bottom, you can find a lot more information. But in uh, general, internationalization is basically enabling a platform, designing it to be able to handle multiple languages, right? And that is something that you know is basically in in inherent in the way you're designing the platform itself. Localization, on the other hand, is taking that you know le multiple multiple language ready platform to be able to add translation uh, translations for different languages onto it, so that multiple languages can actually be used on that platform. So there's two different parts of it, and then multilingualization which is also another term that is used quite often, is where multiple languages are used for display and input. And uh, a single UI language is distributed as a default, but then you can change it according to locale for features like uh, date, time, currency, you know, things that you can see on the UI, just standard. So um, what am I going to be talking about? I'm ta talking about you know, different areas that we are actually serving uh, language support on for Wikipedia websites, Wikimedia uh, websites, Wikipedia users. In, at a very high level, uh, what are we doing? The magnitude of our work and the impact of it is pretty large. Um, we are serving content in 284 plus languages, which is not uh, trivial. Um, to 482 million plus users monthly, uh, unique users every month. And that's, that's pretty, pretty phenomenal in terms of uh, the impact on the web. We are a very crowdsourced uh, community, as you know, and you know, every single person who has ever tried reading or editing Wikipedia is, is a member of our large, large, large global community and uh, mm, tries to uh, you know, contribute to multi-language support in their own way. And that's what we call as crowdsourcing. Um, I want to talk a little bit about some of the initiatives that we are actually, as an engineering team, working on. One of them is the Universal Language Selector, which actually enables the usage of multiple languages easily and uh, switching from one language to the other easily on uh, all the Wikimedia websites. The other one is, uh, is supporting multiple languages uh, and input methods for multiple languages. Uh, another area is the output software and the fonts, which are used in multiple languages for rendering and reading easily on Wikimedia websites. And then there are other tools that we are looking at, uh, starting to look at, where we are doing a lot of translation uh, inherent within the Wikimedia universe and also beyond that on the open web. Uh, translation is a very large area. It affects every one of us who can speak multiple languages. And we constantly strive to see how we can actually improve our translation tools to be able to support that. And then, of course, deep diving more into search, spell checkers, dictionaries, as we you know, reach that level. 
So I wanted to talk first about improving our reading experience. And the reason for that is that 90% of uh, Wikimedia users today are readers. You know, with a, a, by and large, uh, most of our users are very, very tied to Wikimedia websites because they like to go and read about different topics in different languages. And that really is the major constituency of our um, user base or our community, if you will. So um, as we see tremendous amount of growth in terms of our readership come becoming global, it's not only the US, it's not only Europe, it is actually Asia coming online, uh, Latin America coming online, and uh, even uh, the Middle East and EMEA coming online, which is very interesting. The Middle East and Africa also, as it gets more broadband uh, you know, access in different areas coming online. So the contribution um, ratios are shifting. And uh, whether that is for readership or for editing, uh, it is, again, something where having a good user experience for reading is very, very essential in multiple languages. So we all read, I mean, in English. How many of you are English Wikipedia users? Probably everyone, right? Uh, how many of you use other languages? Hey, that's awesome, right? Almost everyone here. Um, how many of you use only Latin-based languages, which is English, French, German, Dutch? Almost all, all of you, right? <laughs> but there are, there is the rest of the world, which is uh, above and beyond the 700 million, 750 million, you know, who use English a lot. Uh, who are actually using other non-Roman scripts and non-Roman languages, right? And that includes the uh, folks in Asia. That includes uh, a lot of uh, native languages in Latin America. It uh, includes many of the scripts used in Africa and uh, in the Middle East. So that's quite a large number of other people coming online. Um, so reading and rendering content in non-Roman languages is pretty key for uh, the expansion of the next generation of Wikimedia content, right? Whether that is content on, Wiki on the Wikipedias themselves or pictures or images or tagging or multimedia or video, audio, whatever we look at, it is pretty key that as we go into the next generation and say that how, do, how are we going to actually uh, increase the number of users who are consuming content on the Wikimedia websites, uh, where are they coming from? And that growth definitely will be happening from the rest of the world, right? So supporting non-Roman languages becomes a pretty key mandate in terms of providing language tools to be able to extend that support for everybody else to join in. And as we know, today all the computer systems are by and large geared towards supporting Latin characters, right? So keyboards, computer systems, key maps, everything inherently is English-based. Or perhaps if we are lucky, it might be Chinese-based sometimes or Japanese-based, but not really um, above and beyond that. It could be some other Latin languages, but nothing much about that. So being a huge, huge, huge consumer and provider of content in the Wikimedia universe, how do we actually substitute for that lack of you know, uh, fonts and languages being supported inherently within the operating system or even within the web browsers, right? Because those are the two platforms that we are sitting on top of. Um, so we are looking at how we can expand and provide a choice of open web fonts. Um, by having the ability to embed web fonts on demand for different languages. And that's one of the key areas that you know, we are really emphasizing on, making sure that we have web fonts within the browser also inherently, especially the open browsers like Firefox or Chrome, um, to be able to you know, provide those fonts by default for different languages. So, our initiative is also called Web Fonts. And basically, if you look at it, it's a tool that uh, embeds fonts on demand 
on a Wikipedia page. It supports multiple language scripts above and beyond the Roman languages, but also many non-Roman languages. Uh, the RTL languages, right to left, which are like Hebrew, Arabic, Persian, you know, different languages. Uh, Khmer, Burmese, the Indic languages, and lots more that are being added. And uh, this is not only being done by the engineering team itself, it's actually the community also, which is adding a lot more support for many of these uh, fonts. And I think it's a pretty, pretty revolutionary feature for us because it gives us the ability to provide a better user experience, reader experience, by able to being uh, pushing, uh, by able to push web fonts, you know, which are of high quality, open source formats, uh, to the user. So I did just highlight this, and then of course, any of you who are developers or are interested in contributing should deep dive, take these links, and take a look at some of our specs. So this is the technical spec um, and some important URLs. Uh, WebFonts currently is a MediaWiki extension, but we are trying to, you know, and making sure that we are actually going to make it reusable across other open source projects and other platforms, other websites. So we are kind of, you know, creating a uh, uh, version, if you will, which is about, can be used above and beyond just MediaWiki, which is Wikimedia's platform. The technical spec can be found at mediawiki.org. Um, and some of the major components, which I, some of the uh, engineers who are available here will be actually covering in their own talks, um, are basically our web fonts core, which is written in JavaScript, MediaWiki hooks and configuration, which is in PHP, and then the IATN support, which are the rules, which are also in PHP. And then the fonts themselves, which actually are very reusable, and they are, those are free and open source, right? So they're under the open font license. So uh, please go and check out the source code and uh, take a look at how you can add some more languages for your support. Yes. Sorry, I, I, I had written this. Yes. So internationalization is uh, short formed to I18N, and localization is short formed to L10N, standardly. <laughs> Good. Um, so um, I'd like to also go a little bit more into the uh, input methods. And I, Amir is saying I have four, four minutes, so uh, I do want to stay on time. Um, the input methods are also the other important area where we are really, really doing a lot of engineering work in. Um, again, input methods extended to support non-Roman languages. It is, uh, by and large today, m most of the content that is getting added in non-Roman languages, which is above and beyond, you know, English, French, Dutch, uh, German, uh, is done by Google Translate or by Bing trans, uh, Translator, you know, where you bring, it, uh, bring up an interface on the, web, on, a on the web. It's not free or open source, but you know, people type in in a, in a language that they're familiar with, and then they uh, translate it into a different language, cut and paste that content, and then put it into Wikipedia. And that's something that you know, is, is OK, but it's not really integrated with our stack, right? We are, we are an open source platform, and we are not really providing those tools yet. So having Narayam and integrating that, which is our input method tool, is basically going to support and make that enabled across multiple languages. So um, I wanted to introduce Narayam because it was actually a community-driven dri effort from our Indic uh, development community, which was contributed initially in its first version to uh, to the um, uh, MediaWiki uh, stack, and it means stylus in Malayalam, uh, which is basically a writing implement, and uh, is the name of our extension for the input method tool. It allows you to put in input text in, in t integrated into Wikipedia for typing in your own language in a non-Roman script or, or any other script for that matter. Um, it does. Uh, it is Unicode standards compliant, so uh, it does support a lot of key maps for uh, being able to support different keyboard layouts, and uh, that is a huge area in itself because over time, people who have used typewriters or have 
use different kinds of input devices, have gotten used to multiple generations of key maps, and the idea really here is to provide that in an on-screen uh, user experience. So not drive it so much dependent on the device that you're using for input methods, but actually making it more on-screen and you know, uh, independent of those, uh, you know, uh, the lack of support on the hardware level, if you will. And that's very important because that actually drives the paradigm towards supporting tablets and mobile uh, computing in the long run. Because input, uh, you know, on-screen input methods would always support you across multiple platforms. The nice thing also is that these key maps are open source, so to be able, you can go and reuse it for a different website. You can go and reuse this across other web browsers, and that's that's pretty key technology. Again, the NARIM technical spec is again it, it, today it is a MediaWiki extension, but it was uh, also one of those extensions that we are trying to working on making MediaWiki independent so that it can be actually used by other websites across the web. Um, the technical specification again is on MediaWiki.org, um, and the major parts. I am just looking at very high level of the architecture. These are very simple extensions. You can actually look, take a look at the code if you're interested, and it's very. Ella, you know, uh, simple in, in terms of understanding and the structure of it. There are MediaWiki hooks in the configuration in PHP, the NARIM core and the Java rules for uh, input methods in, the, uh, ja in JavaScript and jQuery, and then the IET NAN uh, support for multiple languages in PHP. The code, again, is in our uh, open rep repositories, which is under Garrett, Git Garrett. So you can take a look at that if you are interested. And uh, the third component that I wanted to talk about today, just to you know, have um, a level set and awareness, this is a new project that we have actually been working on in the last few months. Uh, uh, we started earlier this year. And this is the universal language selector. And this is very key to the Wikimedia universe especially, because it is actually uh, uh, pretty design-driven effort to improve the user experience for all users who are multi multiple language users to be able to switch the user interface also and the and the chrome the chrome support as well as the content support for uh, multiple languages right and what this does is it gives you the ability over time to be able to ch choose the language of your choice for the Chrome, which is the UI, the labels that you see on an on you know on a Wikipedia page, the input method preference for what language you will be typing in if you were editing, the web font preference for the language where you will be reading a Wikipedia article in, and the content language. That is, if you were actually starting to edit then what would you actually be looking at and what kind of font would you be using for the content. So it's actually got a uh, pretty significant impact once it uh, rolls out. You, uh, ULS is very interesting because we are looking at uh, providing a uh, geographical region-based picker with a map as well as searching for a language within a search box and pruning that list and also looking at making sure that it is um, designed in such a way so that it can be integrated and reused by other open source projects or even the browser itself. So that's pretty significant because we are not really tying this only into MediaWiki, which is Wikimedia's but platform. I'm curious, by default, what's Wikipedia for Latin language? What is the default font that they use? So th so the default fonts today for Latin languages are inherited from the browser and the platform preferences that you have set, right, or are rolled out. And we actually will only change it if you have specified it as a user preference. But it is actually being you know, inherited, if you will, from the computer OS that you're running, whether that's Windows or uh, Ubuntu or you know, any other flavor of Mac or from the browser itself, okay? So this is a 
the third layer, right, where you're changing it at the application layer. And Namir says, I only have one minute, so I will make sure that we finish. Um, you have ULS? Time for questions. You, you have, have time for questions. Okay, cool. So, um, ULS again, these are the technical specs. We actually have, uh, you know, put in a very, very uh, heavy effort into actually trying to make sure that the user experience design work is done right and done well and uh, with community feedback. And that analysis and design can be actually found at mediawiki.org. Um, our designer, uh, Pau Giner, is here. So if you have design questions after you take a look at this, you can find him anytime during the conference and um, ask him questions. And today at 3.40 at this room. Yes, exactly. We have quite a lot of sessions going on today. The technical spec, which is actually very interesting to read because this is you know, where you're combining the usage of multiple languages on such a large website is also very interesting to read. So take a look at that if you have a chance. Um, and then, of course, the uh, cool thing about this extension is that it is written in JavaScript almost all, completely. So that's actually pretty awesome. And we have, of course, MediaWiki hooks and configuration for talking to MediaWiki, which is you know, Wikipedia's uh, platform again. Source code, that's the URL, so please do take a look at it. And I uh, just wanted to show a little bit of the complexity in terms of the design work that you know our uh, UX uh, uh, designers have been doing. We've actually been looking and trying to work out through all the workflows for input settings, display settings, language selection, content, you know, and looking at the different paths in terms of identifying how do users actually use multiple languages and how do they switch context, how will they actually be using it for display settings, language selection, language lists, context. So take a look at this documentation. It is on MediaWiki.org and it's very cool to read. Uh, the language selector in itself, I know that Pao will also be doing a demo later. And we will be doing demos for both the input methods, uh, tools, as well as web fonts a little later. So I just want to introduce that. It is very cool because you can see that you can select input settings with a map you know, by region. And also the display settings, which means how are you reading this, right? So how are you typing and how are you reading? Um, you can also search with uh, language name, um, country or ISO code, which means that say you are in, uh, in Asia, right? And this is a uh, Asia list that is displaying right now, you actually will get a more fine-tuned list uh, depending on the area that you are in, right? Or the languages that you are um, looking at from that region. So lots of lots of cool stuff. Um, wanted to talk a little bit about the display settings and the input settings, how the ULS selector is trying to use this. And again, it's very simple. The font settings, if you have multiple languages that you're selecting, whether they're Roman or non-Roman, should be able to select the languages, first of all, first, second, third choices. And then also the fonts, that is, for the scripts that you're rendering. And sometimes there are many choices for each language, where you have multiple types of fonts, depending on if, you were, if you're good at Greek, right? You can have a classical Greek font versus a spoken, you know, a regular uh, written Greek font. So there are different kinds of fonts and you can select that through the selector. The other area is the input settings where you can actually select the kind of uh, input method that you're going to be using and uh, the language can be selected as well as the phonetic input, translit transliteration, uh, different styles of the way input methods are used or you can even disable it right now. So there's a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of uh, functionality that is getting rolled into this. And my last slide, which is what are we doing next? We are doing this, and this is actually going to take us about um, um, uh, you know, the rest of the year to work on. But we are very much interested in looking at enhancing user experience for multiple uh, languages and multilingual users, improve our UI workflows, uh, add more la uh, languages to our input key maps, build APIs for translation, input methods, ULS, uh, add more fonts, better quality open source fonts, uh, translation UI improvements. We are also going to improve our translation interfaces. Uh, we are going to look at search, improving search across multiple languages, spell checkers, dictionaries, translation, transliteration bindings, 
and possibly also rolling out language support in language packs. So lots of, lots of different initiatives that are on our roadmap. And I uh, just want you to read this because uh, there are two things I want to emphasize. Again, we are totally driven uh, by our community and support our community. Um, and I would like uh, folks who are interested to actually be able to contribute, right? Um, like you to test the software that we are building and report bugs. You can use Bugzilla, wikimedia.org to report bugs. It's open and free and, and easy to use. Write code. If you, any of you are developers, PHP, JavaScript, CSS, HTML, we are always hiring. Um, help document some of our extensions. Build fonts if you are photographers. Contribute key maps for your languages. Translate in your language. That's something that you can always add. Uh, add more content to Wikipedia in your own language. Internationalize your s uh, software, which is pretty important because you have to think about internationalization from day one when you build your software. Help us keep the web open and free. It's very important. Wikipedia is all about it. And please join our developer community mailing lists because there's a lot of conversation happening there. And it is very important to participate. And last but not least, if you're interested in jobs, come and talk with me. <laughs> Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, why the 18 and the 10 in internationalization and in globalization? Why is the uh, uh, like Read Wikipedia. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. So then I go back and I write um, <coughs> word in Swedish, comma, originally from, <coughs> add a couple of characters, and then I finish what I was going to read, and then I enter it. I mean, would there be any way of showing to the user this is sort of a box, outside this box is left, right, inside this box is the right, left, inside the box, inside the box, and basically, but somehow make it, make it easy to understand <coughs> what mode the cursor will currently be in, or, or, or something else that helps you understand what you're doing. I can, I can answer that actually. Uh, basically, your your browser already supports this. W whichever browser you use, it already supports this. If you install uh, a right to left keyboard in your operating system, uh, then the cursor will look correctly. Uh, if you don't, then uh, it's a bit more complicated, but there probably will be a solution for that in the visual editor. That's more or less the answer. Yes. It. Uh, yeah. So it's it's the it's the not so near future. I'll be honest. I I wrote the specification for th exactly that part which you were talking about. I wrote the requirements. They haven't started implementing it yet, but we hope to start implementing it uh, very soon. So it's a matter of hopefully months. Right, and, and that's the important part, right? If you, if you write software, internationalize it day one, right? Think about how these uh, cross-language issues and how that will be represented, right? How will it be viewed, read, and relevant? So uh, again, the, the visual editor team is actually, uh, which has put out an initial version you have seen, uh, is uh, looking at internationalizing the editor uh, in the next few months. So that's something that we will definitely we have in mind. Yes. How easy is it to add an additional script? You have you have key maps, so it's yes. code numbers. You have web fonts. So, so I I have one language, but then I look at the code, then I want to add another one. It's it's very easy. It's actually very easy, and. Um, you can do it two ways. One, that you can actually check out the code, look at the code. It's actually very uh, replicable. 
So you can actually just replicate another section and add those rules, or you can actually uh, connect with one of our uh, team members and we'll add it in. Yeah, yeah. hi. So uh, I'm really glad that you have these questions. Uh, an hour from now, in this room exactly, there will be a Q&A session for questions like this yeah. with the whole of our team. Yeah. So please come and ask uh, this. There's like a whole session about that. Um, OK. So. Uh, Okay, please. Uh. So um, Amir is uh, one of our internationalization engineering team members, and uh, he's actually going to talk about the software localization paradox. He's based in Israel, and it's very interesting because our engineering team is actually completely distributed across the world, and uh, it's pretty cool. So uh, he'll, again, be deep diving in. He's a linguist also. So please reserve your questions for our Ask the Developers session a little later. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, hi. So uh, are, you, are you familiar with these? So this is English, and this is Russian, and this is Hebrew, and there are probably, there are probably uh, something like this in, in y all of your languages, too. So there's something that I uh, dreamt of doing for quite a while now. So uh, are you familiar with this? Probably many of you are familiar with this. So I'm going to distribute to you these uh, sheets of paper. So please write citation needed on it in your language. And if I say something stupid, please raise it. <laughs> because uh, this, this talk is uh, very much about discussion. The talk itself is quite short. And I really want to hear your opinions and your questions about it. So can you please distribute these? Write, it, write citation needed in your language. And don't be afraid of raising it. OK, so uh, Alolita asked this already, but uh, I'll ask again. Um, uh, please raise your hand if English is not your la native language. OK, quite a lot. Nice. Uh, however, uh, do you use software in English? Do you use your web browser in English? Mm, quite a lot of people use it in English. So uh, uh, why aren't you using software in your own language? Uh, so there are many answers to that, possible answers. I'd like to hear some of yours uh, in a few minutes. Um, but uh, basically, uh, what, what this presentation is about is uh, this question, OK, I know English, so I can use software in English. Uh, I, I can avoid all these problems that people who use translated software uh, have. Uh, I don't want any of this. So I'm going to tell you why you should still use software in your language, or at least try to. Um, basically, uh, there probably are, for most languages of the world, there probably are some people who know that language and don't know English. Um, and now, there's a little comment here. I say English all the time. Actually, it, it's not only English. It, uh, instead of English, it can be any one of major languages, like French or Portuguese or Russian. What's that? No, that's it. Uh, oh, you're just trying. No, I'm just like, you're I just. I don't know why, you, why you're saying that. You say <laughs> well, both are melting in my case. Yeah, yeah, so what's, what's exactly the problem? So why, why can you use it in our language? What, what, what is your source for that? <laughs> <laughs> my, 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 okay, my, 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 uh, my source for what? Am I not allowed to show me it? No. Oh, okay. No. No. <laughs> But but that's a nice try. Okay. Uh, so the fact is that quite a lot of people don't speak English. Uh, don't not even as a second language, not even as a third language. They don't know English at all. Just imagine yourself as a tourist in some uh, country, even in some rather developed country. Uh, lots of people don't know English, and they don't know uh, Spanish. They don't know Italian. They don't know any of the major languages that have big Wikipedia's. Uh, now, this, that's a citation needed that I wrote myself. Uh, quite a lot of people that don't know any major language now quite likely will not learn it anytime soon. How do you define major language, though? I mean, like How do I? Um, because, like, Hindi is a major language in India. Exactly. OK, exactly, exactly. So that's, that's, that is quite true. It's all very relative. Now, uh, in, in very simplistic terms, English is probably the most major language. Yeah. French and Spanish and Portuguese are probably somewhere uh, so in the second line. You're proposing a 
because of the um, yeah, so, westernization. Yeah, so okay, so basically wh when I say major language, um, it's, it's something that's very hard to measure. I tried to find sources for this because I, I really, seriously, I really tried. <laughs> it's, it's hard, it's hard. Uh, it's uh, statistics about uh, people who know uh, language as a second or, or a third language. It, it's, it's quite hard. So it's, it's pretty safe to assume that uh, much less than half of the population of the world know English. Um, so the question is, for example, Chinese is a language that is spoken by more than a billion of people, but there are relatively few people who know it as a second language. So, so it's major by itself, but it's not very important as a second language. English is very important as a second language, and yet not everybody knows it. There are lots of people who know uh, Hindi, only Hindi, and the only Wikipedia that they can access is uh, Hindi. That's the only one they can read. They can, they can either invest a lot of time uh, and effort in learning English, and then they have access to the English Wikipedia, uh, or they need the Hindi Wikipedia to be bigger, which now has, I think, less than 100,000 articles. So that's basically what is it about. Uh, I mean, you're fine by yourself. You, you can do very well with the English Wikipedia or with, or with the Russian Wikipedia or Italian, uh, but the other, people, uh, the, the people who, the other people who speak your language, they are they don't have that access. Now, how does it help if you at least start using software in your language? It will help uh, uh, because there's this paradox, and that's, wha that's wha where the title of this talk comes from. You see, you are the people who can report the problems with localizations, like wrong translations, uh, problems with display, uh, anything like that, incomplete translations where you see something in English and something in another language. Um, but if you use it in English, you, you never even notice the problems. And, and I'm talking about reporting. I'm not talking about fixing the problems. Because, uh, but well, the problem cannot be fixed if nobody reports it. Because the fact is that, uh, well, again, it's a bit of a citation needed. But uh, as much as uh, I uh, checked, for example, uh, Microsoft Israel employees do not use Windows in Hebrew. They use it in English. Google Israel employees do not use uh, Google in Hebrew. They use it in English. Google India employees do not use Gmail in uh, Hindi or Marathi or Canada. They use it in English. And uh, exactly. So it's uh, so I, I really hope that all these companies will tell their employees to eat their dog food, as Sebron says. Uh, but, but the fact currently is that they don't. All, all, all the Google and Microsoft employees that I met used software in English. And w I, I tried to switch uh, a, uh, s uh, somebody <coughs> who works in Google in um, India. Uh, he, he used Gmail in English. And I tried to switch him to Marathi, which is the language spoken in the area of Mumbai. Uh, and it didn't work. Uh, apparently, uh, Marathi didn't work correctly in Gmail. And he was a Google employee himself. He never no even noticed it, even though Marathi is his own language. So that's, that's the kind of a paradox I'm talking about. So if you just use software, use your web browser, use your operating system, uh, use Wikipedia, I'm, I'll get to that in a, in a minute, uh, you'll be able to report that. Um, and, and well, there's also the other side, which is the people who don't know English, they are not able to report that at all, because probably the developers only speak English. And uh, you, you need to know English to report the bug. And I I even, even before that, they, they won't even know that there is any problem. They will notice that something is kind of wrong, but they, but they don't know what's, uh, what, the ma what that uh, line was supposed to be in the first place. So that's, that's the problem. That's, that's, that's uh, one kind of a uh, digital divide. There's this buzzword here. But this, this is a very nice uh, example of that. So what kind of problems I'm talking about? I'm, I'll go over that very quickly, some possible problems. And th these are actually cited as reasons why I don't use software in my language. Why do I prefer English? So, so the most basic thing is that, well, the programmers wrote it in English. Uh, and I know English. So I, I see the software as the programmer intended me to see it. Uh, so that's like the basic thing. But, but OK, so except all these other people are left out. Uh, so examples uh, are bad translations. Uh, just you know, a, a translation of some software message is wrong. If you see a, a mistake in the in the interface of Wikipedia, please fix it at this link. Uh, incomplete translations. Uh, this is uh, actually quite common in the many languages of India and in Arabic and in many other languages. Uh, pe people have hard time inventing 
computer terms for in their languages, should they translate them or should they just transliterate the English name into their alphabet or, or anything like that? And then they make up some term, but uh, everybody else doesn't know it. So again, uh, translatewiki.net, that's uh, the website that we maintain for translating software. The, these are, this is exactly the kind of problems that can be discussed there. Uh, problems with right to left interface for Arabic and Hebrew and uh, Persian and languages like that. Uh, that's definitely a bug that you should report if you see anything like that. Uh, for example, uh, the U in the first line here, you, you're definitely welcome to write something like that in Bugzilla. That's, that's, a, that's a kind of an example that we want to see more uh, in Bugzilla. Uh, missing fonts, that was uh, what uh, Alorita was talking about. Um, so again, people say, okay, I, I, try to use, I try to use Gmail in my language, but I see squares instead of, uh, instead of uh, the, this link that is supposed to show me the inbox. I don't have the font on my computer, so I cannot use it. But okay, but millions of people who speak this language, they also cannot use it, and Google doesn't even know it. And that's the kind of thing. Um, so what can you do? Uh, and this is something really, really simple that requires very little effort. Uh, the easiest, the most obvious thing that you can do, you can do it right now. Um, start reading and editing Wikipedia in your language more. Uh, now, if you speak in one of the um, like major European languages, like, um, like German or Spanish, you're probably doing that already. Uh, if you speak in a smaller language, like some language of India or Africa, uh, or, or Burmese or something like that, uh, your Wikipedia is probably not very big and not very informative. So if you look for information, you will probably quite often not find what you're looking for. Uh, and well, in that case, you have no choice but to go to English or French. Uh, but uh, hey, give it a few minutes and translate the article into your language, or at least see the current state of your Wikipedia, uh, just, just so you would know what, what, what do other people that speak your language, wh how do they see it? Uh, something that's a bit less obvious is that you can use uh, the English Wikipedia you, to see the content in English, but to see uh, the interface, all the menus, like the login link and uh, the, the edit button, uh, you can see it in your language. So you, again, you'll see the content of the article in English, you'll see the edit link uh, in your language. Uh, that's currently done in the preferences, in your user preferences. Uh, very soon it will be able, it will be done using the universal language selector. That's again what Aloita was talking about. Um, and okay, you can uh, switch your web browser, uh, uh, the, the menus in your web browser to another language. Like do that right now. If, if your web browser, if the menus of your browser are uh, in English, please switch it right now in Chrome. It's very, very easy. In Firefox and Internet Explorer, it's a bit harder, but, but still very, possible. Um, uh, switch the preferred language of your web browser. It was something that lots of people don't know, is that uh, in the preferences of your web browser, you can define a language that you prefer. What it actually means is that when you visit a website that is translated to, to many languages, it will show you the website in that language. You will be surprised how many websites are actually translated to, to your language. Uh, if you install the default English browser, uh, switch it. Try, try to switch it to Spanish or Russian or Italian, and you'll see that website uh, in that language. That's very, very fre frequent. Uh, uh, switch the user interface of your word processor, uh, of your whole operating system. In Linux, it's very easy. In uh, latest versions of Windows, it's also reasonably possible. Uh, I don't know about Mac. Um, and if any of the above are not available in your language, just start it. Uh, new languages are added to, to MediaWiki, uh, Seabrand, something like what? Like every two or three weeks, we add support for a new language. So um, quite, well, quite often, every few weeks. Yes. Something like that. It's, it's, it, doesn't, it doesn't mean that it, the whole... It the languages don't necessarily make it into media wiki, but... Well, it's, there are minor languages. People who ask to add there some small language from China or from India or from South America to add them, add support for them to MediaWiki. It doesn't mean that it will be uh, translated uh, very quickly and completely, that we'll have a million article Wikipedia uh, right away, but you can start it. Uh, and you can tell your friends who speak small languages to start it, just be bold and do it. Um, and really it's easier than you think. Um, uh, something that I've been hearing quite a lot, especially from people in India and uh, also in other countries is that 
they say, oh, well, yes, but I don't know my native language so well, um, which is a bit of a contradiction because if it's your native language, you are supposed to know it well. Uh, very often what people mean is that uh, they can speak it, but uh, they're not used to read or write it because they're used to the fact that computers work in English, so they, they speak with their family in some uh, language of India or Africa, mm, but they use computers in English. Just, you know, be bold. After a few days, it, it passes and, and you get used to it. Uh, I, I tried it, seriously. For, for, for a long while, I used computers only in English. Then one day I just decided to switch to Hebrew, and it's not that bad. <laughs> it's, it's quite, seriously, I mean, it's, it's, it's possible. You get used after a few days. Um, and uh, please bug us. I mean, seriously, these links again, please use them a lot. Uh, any uh, translation problems uh, in translatewiki.net, uh, most of them you can just fix yourself. Uh, Bugzilla, any technical bugs, please use this website a lot. Please do this all the time. Uh, you can reach me on Twitter very easily. Uh, now, I was talking here mostly about um, Wikipedia. These websites are for Wikipedia and the software around it. Quite a lot of other software products uh, have bug reporting uh, websites. Uh, most uh, open source um, programs have bug uh, reporting websites. Uh, Mozilla has it, uh, OpenOffice has it. Ubuntu, lots of other, um, lots of other projects. Uh, some non-free software has a tool like Twitter. Uh, it's reasonably possible to correct translations in Twitter. Also in Facebook, I, I personally don't like the interface in Facebook, but the fact is that it's quite possible to switch Facebook to another language and to contribute your own translations. It's even possible in Microsoft and Apple products. That's hard. Uh, but I managed to, to find people who work in Microsoft and Apple and s report them localization problems in Hebrew. It's hard, but possible. Uh, so just, just try it. Just don't, don't give up. Because uh, uh, really, when you get to, to, uh, to the bottom line, the people who don't speak English really need you, need the help of uh, each and every one of you. Just start using this. You'll see the problems. Be bold and report them. Uh, that's more or less what I had to say. If you have any questions, if you think that I'm wrong, please uh, speak to me. Uh, a language like Spanish. Yes. Uh, that we have uh, different terms uh, for different countries. Mm -hmm. uh, you, not, you, you need to choose your language and you need to choose your location. Yes. I'm appealed by your request that I, because I use it in English, the software, because I'm very lazy. Do, wh where are you from? I'm, I'm Spanish. You're from Spain? Yeah. OK. Um, so uh, for Spanish and for practically any other language, uh, we support language variants, which means that uh, we support Spanish Spain and Spanish Latin America. We can add also more varieties. We can add Spanish Colombia, Spanish Chile, if, if it makes any sense. It's possible, technically. We can do that. Uh, we have uh, English US by default, but uh, if you prefer British English, it can be British, it can be Canadian. Uh, so it's technically possible. Um, really not much of a problem. We, we have the technical support for it in Translate Wiki and in Media Wiki, and many, many other programs have support for that too. So it's perfectly possible. But the basic is that the community needs to do it. Uh, well, it's, it's, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's perfectly possible. We have communities for each variant. Yeah, one more question. That's it. Thank you. OK, the third and last presentation in this block is going to be by Mark Laporte. Um, Mark Laporte is of wikitranslation.com. He's also active in the Tiki Wiki community. Uh, the topic of his uh, presentation is uh, Crosslingual Wiki Engine Enabling Collaboration Across Language Barriers. Mark Laporte. Hi, hi everyone. So while that reboots, um, maybe start with a few questions. So uh, of the people here, so of course everybody's editing on Wikipedia, but how many people are um, translating as well on Wikipedia? Not that many. That's bad, bad, bad. OK, so um, one of the big things uh, that we've come across with the, the wikis is really question of 
keeping content in sync. And that's basically what we see all the time. So I'll start with a little intro about me, what happened. Basically, I got, I got into wikis a long time ago. And I figured, hey, this is fun. I started using it as a, as a tool to organize communities, to organize online communities. And since I'm from Canada, we have two official languages and some regional languages. So um, what that means, official language, by law, means that whatever's in one language is, has the same effect in the law than the other. So that's ta it's taken very seriously. And I think people that come from countries that, have, that don't have a, several official languages maybe underestimate that. So that's been always um, a challenge for us in our, all the web projects, really to be good in terms of multilingual. So, so that's how I got started. And then basically, uh, this was an ongoing challenge of how do, you keep, how do you keep the content in sync? And since I speak both languages, even just for myself, keeping both pages in sync was difficult. But then from the moment there was a third language that I could not speak, then it's like, it's, it's, it's not something you can even catch up with time. You really need a better system. So I figured, well, there must be someone. You know, the web's a big place. Somebody must have solved this problem, right? So we looked around, looked around, sent some emails. Some people <laughs> had some proof of concept. Some, lots of people had ideas, but nobody had really, had really solved that problem of keeping content in sync. So, um, so, so eventually what we, we got together and we said, okay, let's try, to, uh, let's try to nail this problem and let's try to solve it in a, in a good way. That's what I want to talk to you about today. So the project is called Crosslingual Wiki Engine, and basically, um, so who am I? I already told you about. What's the problem? It's basically about keeping the content in sync. Um, what's the solution? Well, what we worked on. So this is my launch row. Of, so out of sync uh, pages basically caused a problem where, and this was very well described in a previous talk, where people that could help the problem by translating things, they're not really interested because they're always going, for example, to the English version of Wikipedia or of any wiki and because that's where the information is. Because they're, so it's a, it's, it's a, it's a self-defeating process where things never get to improve. So, There we go. Okay, so here's an example. For example, the same page in English and in French. Of course, one has uh, way more content. You guys are familiar with that. So one of the big problems is that translation industry is very um, established. It's very old. It, we've been translating stuff for a long, long time. But all the methods and all the way people work in the uh, translation industry wasn't designed for what we have today. And it has lots of assumptions on how translation is supposed to be done. And we'll see that all those assumptions basically uh, don't, don't work in our wiki world. So basically, and even in their own world, it's theoretical because in practice it doesn't work. So first thing, we expect to have a master language in a translation. Let's say you have a translation department. You're expected, for example, you're, you have a document, let's say in English, and then it's going to be translated in four languages. Well, that may work in a closed circuit in some company or organization, but of course, on a wiki where everybody's participating, that can't work. So one of the big problems is, let's say you have someone who knows something in Japanese, but doesn't speak English. Well, if you're using English as a master language, you lose that content. Assumption number two okay, is edit freeze. So that even in, uh, like in theory, that exists. But even in practice, translators are always very 
uh, concern that the content is not finished when it get, they get it. They start translating, and then they get some new content, and they, lose a, they waste a lot of time on that. And that's why they have some fancy systems of uh, translation memories, which will remember all the stuff that's already been translated. So if they receive, for example, a, a, a word processor document five times during the same week, and it changes all the time, they use this translation memory because they don't have a good versioning system to know what was translated. So if we had a good versioning system, probably translation memories would be less important, but they're crucial today. Of course, in a wiki world, uh, edit freeze, that doesn't work because by design, wikis are not supposed to, are not supposed to, to finish. Then enforceable timely translation. Well, that makes sense if you're uh, in a company or something, but how is that going to work, for example, on something like Wikipedia? You can say, OK, you've got to translate everything by next Tuesday. We, that would never work. Um, <laughs> so, And even if you did try to make some conventions or some rules or guidelines, what would happen if people are not able, they're not, inf they're not enforceable? So eventually, nothing's going to happen. So. You, you can't delay things. You got to basically take, that's part of the wiki uh, idea, is you take whatever you can get from contributions and you organize it. The fourth thing is that normally in a traditional translation workflow, you have um, controlled language pairs. So basically, I'm a translator. I am always tra translating from English to French, or French to Spanish, or English to Spanish, or whatever. But in Wikipedia, or any wiki, that's not what's going to happen. People, people are going to translate a bit in, a, in any direction, depending on what their skills are. And again, we want to leverage uh, those skills. So <coughs> the other thing is strong coordination. Well, that could happen with a small team. And if, you, if you've worked in the translation industry, you've seen like they have translation coordinators. You may have one person full time just managing the work of 5, 10, or 15 people. And it's very difficult to get all the schedules. Yeah. So of course, in a web-based, uh, decentralized organization, that would never work. And again, what would be the consequences? How could you enforce that? Um, then there's the question of separating authorship and, uh, and translation. Here I have a theory on that. Um, I think a lot of translators, they would like to write as well. They would like to be writers. I, you know, Some may just like translating, but I think every once in a while they would like to write. Well, an opportunity in the wiki world is that they can be both writers and translators. But in the traditional translation world, you're a translator. You're not supposed to write anything. So I think that's, you know, we're, 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 we're not leveraging people's uh, skills uh, to not let them participate that way. Probably a little boring to be just translating all the time. Then the last thing is, the last assumption is that we have trained translators. So people with tools, skills, um, and that that have like a, a way of working which fits. Of course, if you get a bunch of people and you're crowdsourcing something, that's not going to happen. So those are the seven assumptions that even some of them don't even work in a traditional translation world. Forget it. On a wiki, all that is thrown out the window. And that's why I think there's not a lot of good tools out there to do that because the translation industry is decades old or maybe hundreds of years old, but uh, the wiki, wikis are really like only 10, 15 years old. So our tools and our ways of working and the people haven't adapted to that yet. So, um, so what do you do when the changes are frequent and small? Uh, what happens when the translations cannot be expected to be completed? Because normally you, you wouldn't accept that from a translation department that's writing, you know, doing some translation for the government in official language context. Oh, no, sorry, we didn't have time. But in the wiki world, you say, well, you know, this you know, a partly, partially translated uh, page is better than nothing at all. And there's no master language. The main thing is, how do you track all those changes and the propagation? And um, also, about the tools, often the tools that are out there are very, very much designed to translate strings of software. Okay, so for example, we talked about Translate Wiki or Poodle or, or software like that. They're very good for short strings. Uh, but then when you have a long text and things that move around like what you would have on a wiki page, um, they're not designed for that. Maybe one day they'll evolve to be really good at that, but as far as I know, uh, no. that's the plan? Yes. Awesome. So, so what do we do? So we could just say, oh, that's, you know, that's a tough problem. Let's give up. Um, so, so we did a bunch of research trying to find other people, and finally a bunch of us, like you know, after a few emails, we decided at Wiki Sim 2008, I think it was with two, Wikisim 2007. We decided we'd give it a give it a shot. So we set to build it out. So let me show you the result. What is the translator using it? 
Um, typically, wiki pages for small uh, associations, small sites that have two to six languages to keep things in sync. So it's a press releases. And okay. We don't know. Okay. Nobody's nobody's pushed it that that far. Um, in theory, it's designed for any number of languages, mm -hmm. um, and with no master language. But uh, nobody's pushed it more than six languages, and I don't know what would happen. Like you know, what the complexity would become at like thirty or forty uh, languages. I don't know, like ten thousand content pages. Does, it, does that do anything to that? Oh, well, that, that would be a separate problem. Like, yeah, that would just be like server issues and stuff, but. Okay, but that's a tweaky issue. Not, yeah. Not yeah, I'm not worried about that one. Okay. It's more the, what would the UI look like, you know, if we have like. You know. Yeah, okay. So, so the, the user interaction patterns for volume mm -hmm. are not yet clear. That's right. Is it based on media wiki? No, it's based, well, we did a, uh, an abstraction. So basically, the reference implementation is in TikiWiki. Uh, but it's PHP code and the license is LGPL. So we designed it so that it could be deployed to any, uh, t like there's the logic, there's the math logic, which could be reused and the could PHP code. It could, it's just a simplification of the, uh, yeah. of the use case. Okay. It's still, uh, oh, something happening here. Keep up, keep up the questions while I, uh, Um, in, ter in terms of staging, um, so we actually had a project at one point was trying to combine uh -huh. staging and uh, and like the translation part. So it worked, but uh, just in general, staging with wikis is is just very tricky. You know what what happens if the con this part of the content's not approved, and it sort of creates a bottleneck. Yeah. I mean, you don't change the content at all. But you just mm -hmm. have metadata on it that's color coded for staging. Yeah. We do that. Mm -hmm. And it's tricky. No? I mean, the only tricky part with, with, with translation is that we're working some documents that are paginated, so we can do it by page. It's where do you draw the line when you have a big document that's no longer paginated? Because you don't want to draw page lines on translation because sometimes it breaks the middle paragraph. So, mm -hmm. so you have to paginate it differently, but when it's paginated, you just color code it by page. Okay. But then when you're translating, you're able to, to say, I, I've completed this whole page. Well, no, but see, the page, this, this is all based off of data. Right. <coughs> do it that way with translation. Mm -hmm. This is, I, we're not doing translating this way. This is proofreading, but we um, like the like the book. It's like this needs all those pages are staged because so proofread the next one. Oh, okay, right. okay. Yeah. But we have the set up pages, but to do translation, we would we have to do the breaks differently. Yeah, we couldn't use the page breaks of the same document. Yeah, you would just use paragraphs or uh, right. sections. Right. Or, or something. But then, but then it seems to that in your use case, it seems a lot by, like you already have existing documents and you're just reviewing them. You're not building documents, are you? Right, right, exactly. But that's why I was saying it's going to be used with the master language. So it's, it's, a, it's a little simpler to use actually. Okay, the demo's about three minutes, so keep, uh, keep the questions going. With any luck, with any luck I'll have time. Um, we have formalized workflow. Uh, and it's, yeah, so you, you, you mentioned states. Um, well, we, we do have um, something like st st uh, flag revisions in MediaWiki, uh, but it's not really, uh, nobody's really tested it properly with the translation part. Okay, so I, I mean, especially in, uh, in, in, uh, in medical, pharmaceutical, and legal mm -hmm. use cases, those are like absolutely requirements yeah yeah so, so yeah that we have for just not translations just regular wiki edits and in theory it's supposed to work also with translations but I haven't uh, haven't done it uh, firsthand and since the projects have evolved uh, they're all in the same code base but they've evolved separately uh, it would be safer to have like a, a real-world uh, uh, example or proper testing especially uh, in a high-stake uh, example 
so basically this is LGPL code, so it can be included in, in just by any application. So let's say we have a page that's in English. We translate it. So, and there's also a, bit a difference between, for example, in MediaWiki, in each, like in Wikipedia, each language has a different instance that's running. In this case, it's the same instance of the software for all the languages. So here we're going to say, we're going to translate this uh, page, for example, to Spanish. So the system knows that these pages are connected. And notice that we don't have to give it a, a horrible name. It can have the, the real name that would make sense. Of course, you can have coll collisions. For example, a word like introduction in French has the same spelling as introduction in English. So then you're going to have to you know, do some little like uh, underscore en or something like that. So basically, then Tiki takes the text, copies it over. And this was basically in our user testing from the translators. They like translating over something. So that's how, why we decided to do that. And then the translator translates over the existing text. And now we have in Spanish. Now the, the, the user can preview the page to confirm everything's OK. And Tiki says, by default, the translation's in progress. And that's a very important key thing. So since the user is going to say, I, I've translated it completely, I'm now going to remove that part to say it's in progress. And I'm going to tell it it's a complete translation and not just a partial one. And this is how the system knows that at this moment in time, version, let's say, one of, th of this language equals version six in another language. And then we have the Spanish page, and we have a little indicator here that tells us that it's 100% up to date. So then, if I wanted to go to the equivalent translation, I could just click there directly. So, so far, quite easy. We just spit, you know, go from one to the next. Now let's create a French page. So I can, I can start my translation from English or, or from French or from Spanish to French. And in this case, uh, here are my existing translations. So I'm going to add a, a third one. Again, give it any name I want. Create the translation. It becomes part of the translation set. Same thing. It takes the original version, puts it there, and I can translate over it. But in this case, we're going to do a partial translation because the, f the phone rang and I didn't have time to finish. So I, I want the system to know that I'm not finished yet. So now the system tells both the translators and the users what, uh, that the translation is in progress. And it tells me that I'm 66% up to date. And this is a little bogus formula, but it's basically approximate. Now, let's say I want to go back to English. And I'm going to edit it. Then I can go and add some more text. In this case, I can indicate that this is an urgent translation. Let's say it's for an event, and you change the venue. You want people to know right away that this information is, is out of date, and it causes a problem. So then now the system says, OK, these are, then I changed English, so I need Spanish and French to be better. Now it's indicating to the user that the content's out of, out of date. And it offers me to translate. So all the time in the system, we've always tried to make it really interesting for people to encourage them to participate. No. Like well, no, we just, we just tell them, yeah. And then here the system, you don't see it very well on the screen, but you'll see that this part is, not, uh, is just like regular text, and this part here is in green. So it's telling the translator, this is the snippet of text that I need to add to the, other, uh, to the translation. So this was already translated, and then there's at the bottom here, I'll add the translation to Spanish. And this was quite much of a problem, because in the wiki world, things can move around a lot on a page. So when you refactor a page, it, you know, the system can go mad. So this is how, how that helps you. Now, in this case, I could say that's a complete translation. And now, again, the system knows that those two pages are in sync. The urgent request notice is removed uh, for this one. And now, but the French one still needs uh, help. So I can go to the French version. And it's telling me that the urgent request. So if I click on it, um, I'm able to go and do the same thing and do a translation. But in this case, um, let's say we only did part of the page. We say it's a partial translation. And now the system keeps, that, keeps track of that. So it's always telling me which language. And one thing that's a little bit strange is sometimes you can have the English version that's better than the French version, and the French version that's better than the English version. It's more up to date. And the reason is that each one has some content which has not been translated to the other. And that's because we don't need a, a master language. So here we go. 
you can continue the system and basically um, the uh, so the full information is on the, on the website on wiki translation and I may have a few more slides um, that should be somewhere any questions on the uh, on the demo um, is there any way of marking um, I think you have put into my native language. Um, I think this is understandable. Mm -hmm. but somebody might want. I mean, if I were to translate into French, yep. I might make right of it, which is well, clearly understandable. But, mm -hmm. but somebody wants to want to check the spelling or something. Yeah. Yeah, we thought about that. We discussed that. We didn't get to it, but yeah, we like that idea. And the other idea is also to have uh, machine translation on the parts that, like, we assume a human transla a machine translation is better than no translation. So let's say you would have like everything that's been properly translated would be in a certain color, and then the parts you're missing, you would put it in a machine translation, and then with a different color and indicating to the people like, you know, help us complete this uh, this information. That's debatable, by the way. That's mm -hmm. But that there are situations such as yeah. you change the place from this place to this place, this mm -hmm. address, then it's probably easy to translate to a third gen, and then I would rather have it in the previous machine translation. So I don't mm -hmm. think you would use it when, when it appears to be. Yeah. It depends on your use case. Yes? Why should we have only one content, one version, and all of these new content? And what's the model? That's, a, that's actually some of the things we, we, were, we didn't get to. Uh, this assumes that it's the same content that you're trying to do in each language. Wait, Last question. So I don't know if that, that answered the question. No. No, but we're looking for some people that could, uh, could take that on. There's a lot of work that has been done, and the license is compatible, and it's PHP code, so it wouldn't be that much work. Thank you very much.